when we last left off, Bruce Wayne had just regained consciousness after his beating at the hands of Bane. Now this, now this time, the mantle of the Bat is officially passed in Batman 498. The issue is written by Doug Mensch, penciled by Jim Aparo, inked by uh, Rick Burchett, with lettering by Richard Starkings, colors by Adrian Roy, and is edited by Jordan B. Gorfinkel and the legendary Denny O'Neill. Bruce has come out of his coma, and he has realized that, at least at present, Bane runs Gotham. We see this point illustrated with Bane and his crew murdering his way through Gotham's remaining crime bosses, absorbing their gangs by force in the process. It's meant to evoke the murder montages from the end of the films in the Godfather series, but with the level of brutality and the lack of any meaningful resistance in the face of this onslaught um, that the gangs uh, experience and have, it feels more like the assault on nerve from the end from the um, end of Evangelion movie in terms of an utterly ruthless, extremely brutal organization just killing their way through a group of people who are completely unequipped at fighting back. In the Batcave, Tim is having a rough time with this, but Alfred gets him to keep going, and once he's composed, Tim suggests bringing Dr. Chandra Kinsolving in to do physical and psychological therapy. And I gotta say, this has got to be a tough moment character-wise for Tim. His father left comatose and paralyzed, mother killed, and now his mentor similarly, um, again, basically getting taken out of action. Uh, in almost a similar way, not in the sense that Jack got his back broken, but in terms of a significant physical injury that impairs him uh, to a tremendous extent. Alfred, Tim, and John Paul bring Bruce upstairs, with Bruce rambling in a depressed, semi-lucid state before they bring Dr. Kinsolving on board. Alfred and Tim put together a cover story of Bruce wrecking a Porsche, and the two smash up one of Bruce's Porsches before shoving it off a cliff before bringing in Dr. Kin... In before bringing in Dr. Kinsolving. Hmm, you think that's enough, Alfred? Hmm, maybe we should push it off a cliff for good measure. Somewhere in the DC Universe, the hosts of Top Gear, which I believe was still airing at this point in the... like, in the earlier form at this point in the 90s, are weeping openly, and they don't know why. When Dr. Kinsolvin comes in to meet her patient, Bruce is barely cognizant enough to pick up Alfred's clue, cues on their cover story. And I also deeply appreciate that he loses the wavy word balloons as soon as a car gets mentioned, implying that he's regained a degree of alertness. Now, Dr. Kinsolving suspects that something is hinky with that cover story, but that just gives her more reasons to take on Bruce as a patient to get to the bottom of all of this. After she leaves, Tim asks if he should contact Nightwing. Bruce responds, no. Nightwing is his own man now. Dick Grayson is his own man now. Instead, for the time being, the mantle will pass to John Paul, but with a warning not to challenge Bane. Elsewhere in Gotham, Bane tries to recruit Catwoman. She agrees to work with him, but not for him. With Batman of action, it's hard to turn him down outright. The issue ends with Robin and Batman 2 going to meet Gordon at the GCPD as Bruce wonders about telling Bat uh, Chandra that he is, that he was, Batman. This issue does the necessary step of starting us on the path towards Asbat as well as showing Bane solidifying his control of the city, meaning that no matter what Bruce's admonitions on the contrary are, Bane is an opponent who cannot be ignored, at least not for long. Now, next time, John Paul takes his on his first member of the Rogues Gallery as Batman, and the same one who Tim took on as his first major member of the Rogues Gallery, as he goes up against Scarecrow. Before I do that, a little topical thing here. Um, as of this recording, this is the first episode I've recorded since the news came out in a most recent installment of the um, various Bat books that Tim Drake came out as by. What do I think about that? It's fine. Um, I mean, it's he came out as by. It's, he didn't come out as, like, yeah, he, he came out as by. That's fine. I like, don't see anything else to say about that. It's cool. Um, 
there's nothing in the books to like and even these early issues to say otherwise in terms of that that, that there's nothing nothing contrary like he's, he's bi not that he it's how to put it this way with with um Bobby Drake coming out as gay there's plenty of stuff in earlier issues uh, of the various Batman books to make to have it come across fairly clearly that well uh Bobby Drake while he was certainly like he certainly dated women his relationships never really his relationships never really worked out in ways that with a like looking at them in fairly clear case of hindsight it makes total sense and the writers in question who are doing these storylines have said outright like Pepe Nicienza and so forth have said that they would have had um Bobby Drake come out as gay if they could have gotten away with it at the time particularly the comics code same thing with uh Kate Pride and her coming out as um queer as well um interview interviews on um Chris, with Chris Claremont on J.M. Miles explained the X-Men, he has stated, ex stated repeatedly that he would have had, that if he could have gotten away with it with the comics code, Kate would have come out in the come out in the 80s, if not, yeah, it would have come out in the 80s. So, I'm fine with that. Like, we do have a real sense of chemistry between, um, uh, in the, between uh, Tim Drake and the spoiler, which we'll get to when we start getting into more of the Night's Quest storyline. But otherwise, like, but again, like, it's not, it, it, it's it's not um, that Tim Drake was gay and only gay and never had any romantic interest in women. Uh, it's he's bi. And bi representation is important too. Um, and actually by male representation is important too um oftentimes when they like you, you when you encounter by representation work of fiction you'll sometimes come up in the form of a by female character because it lets you get fan servicey with a um with a depiction of a lesbian or romantic relationship or lesbian sexual relationship, and then have them later on be romanced by a audience perspective by a male audience perspective character. So it is important. So it is very important to have by male representation as well. Um, so it, I mean, as it is, good representation is good representation, and ultimately. This will, the key factor here isn't, oh, they've turned Tim Drake by. Like, that's fine. Question is, do you tell good stories with it? Um, or is this going to be a excuse for Pathos to kill off um, Tim Drake's love interest down the road? That's like, that's the real concern, because that's the thing that tends to happen a lot to comics. Is and that's not a just killing off queer characters, though that is certainly a problem. Killing off love interests to for um, dramatic narrative, particularly your women and gay men, um, to or depowering them or that sort of thing for pathos down the road is more of an issue. And we will come to that when we get into the tail end of Night's Quest. But so to keep things on topic. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>